thank you for the introduction and thank you for all coming to, to my talk. Uh, first of all, I would like to start by presenting, um, by thank thanking my co-contributors um, co in SciPy who helped me to not really prepare this talk, but uh, lend the, all these functionalities that we're having now in, in, in SciPy. So Turf Patel, uh, Christoph Baumgarten, and uh, Matt Haberland. So thank you guys. <laughs> and of course, thank you to, to all uh, other SciPy maintainers who help uh, along the way. So today I would like to talk about uh, random sampling and specifically two things that we've been working since roughly two or three years uh, now in SciPy. So it's stat sampling and stats QMC. So QMC for uh, quasi uh, Monte Carlo. And actually I realized that I needed maybe to present a bit what is SciPy um, because um, during this week I could see that a lot of people were actually using SciPy without realizing it and a lot of you had questions about was it actually SciPy and so I, I thought it was granted but no so SciPy is a general um, toolkit scientific library in, in Python and it has many things so uh, tools to play with statistics uh, optimization so um, interpolation integration uh, a lot of things and also some small tools uh, that you, you might use um, in uh, so distance function or in special, we have a lot of, lot of things. So it's really a general library, um, which is at the foundation of a lot of uh, big packages, bigger packages like uh, scikit-learn and also scikit-image, for instance. So what is what are we going to talk about today? So random numbers. So what are random numbers? Um, let's quickly define what, what we mean here. Um, so we are going to talk about drawing something from a set. So draw the, this, this set, uh, it's going to be called a, a variable. And what can we draw? What can this set be composed of? It can be numbers, or things, variables. Um, and so uh, these things, uh, they are called yeah, variables. And um, all these things are, are going to be dimensions. So um, you can have a problem with uh, multiple dimensions, and so we are going to uh, to to refer to this as uh, as dimension. And a sample is just one uh, one draw um, uh, of this of this set. And so in in NumPy, you may have seen this code uh, a lot of time. You define a random number generator, and then you can sample one thousand samples here. And if you have multiple dimensions, so here we have ten dimensions. You specify. The, the again your ten, uh, one one thousand and your number of dimensions like that, um, and so here is another way to to think about these dimensions. Uh, we can plot some um, some um, some subplots in two D like that, so to have dimensions in. Uh, so the first axis is the first dimension, and the second axis is the second dimensions, and. Um, what we're trying to see here is that when we sample randomly points in a space, so this is called a space, we can see some points clustering uh, together, some empty space, things like that. And so imagine you have a, a function that you want to evaluate, that you want to approximate maybe, and you, you want to build an interpolator. Um, and so what you're going to try to do is to sample the space uh, to get uh, a sense of what the function is doing on this space and then build your interpolator to be able to then maybe generate new uh, prediction samples and everything. And what's important here is that you capture the whole physics or the, what, what's, your, what, what's the, the actual function that you're getting. And so in the, in the empty area, for instance, you're not getting any information. And if in this part of the space, there is something happening, a discontinuity, for instance, you will not be able to spot it and you will miss some physics. And so it can be very bad. Um, and so that's why you're, you would want to spread the points in this space to maximize the coverage. And so here is just in two dimensions, uh, using classical NumPy to sample the space and, and yeah, to have just this number of points. And as you grow in dimension, the points are going to be really f far from each other. The space are not um, going to be sampled correctly. And you're going to miss more and more uh, space or physics and like what you're trying to actually capture. So it's really a problem and that's what is called the curse of dimensionality. Maybe you heard, you've heard of that. Um, so 
when you're um, when you're sampling, we we're so np uh, dot random that um, yeah the, uh, the the random number generator. When you do uh, rng dot random, you're sampling using a uniform distribution. But we we can also be interested in run in sampling distributions, so particular distributions, and so. Um, in order to, to sample from particular distributions, what uh, we can do is to use uh, something which is called the inverse CDF method. So that's the classical method which is used. And how that is, does it work? So if you want to sample new points following this distribution, so this is just a classical one dimension distribution, uh, you have two things that you know, it's the PDF and the CDF. And so what we do is actually that we sample the inverse of the distribution. So we go from the F to the X. So we sample uniformly from uh, at, um, with a uniform distribution, and then we backtrace this with the CDF, and we get the new X. So that's called the inverse method, and it allows you to sample any distribution uh, if you are, have access to the, um, to the inverse CDF. So this is how you can do it in, in NumPy, for instance. Again, you have your generator. Uh, you sample this f or x uh, underscore that I noted here. Uh, sample 1,000 times, and then you call the PPF, and which is the, person, uh, and the yeah, percentile function. But, but it can be hard because, so first of all, what is this PPF function? And also, what happens if you don't have access to this PPF function? What happens is the distribution you're trying to sample does not have it. You either need to write it yourself, uh, find some, or interpolate something. So it, it can be complicated. And so what has been done in, in SciPy is that we um, we introduce some methods which are allowing you to um, to do it for you. Um, so it's not only using this PPF and inverse CDF method, uh, but we introduce a whole new uh, class of um, uh, of methods. So thanks to the C library Unirun that we integrated. So this work has been done during a Google Summer of, of Code by Turf Patel. And so he introduced all these black box methods, which allow you to sample easily from any, from a large class of, of distributions. And so if you're really interested in how it's done and, and everything, uh, I invite you to look into the conference proceeding that they, that they wrote. Uh, so automatic random variate generation in Python. And so what did we add in, uh, in SciPy? So we added a few methods to deal with continuous distributions. Um, so depending on the requirements uh, that you have in terms of speed, there are multiple methods you can choose from. Um, mainly, there are two things to consider, the setup speed and the uh, sampling speed. So if you're going to just sample once a distribution, uh, it might be interesting to uh, not care about the sampling speed, but care about the setup speed, because you're going to initialize the object once and then sample just once. But on the other hand, if you have um, a problem where you're going to maybe have on the server um, a generator running and the generator needs to sample multiple times and, and often, uh, you might actually be interested in having a fast sampler uh, but actually not care really about the setup because the setup is going to be done once at the initialization of the server, and then you can just sample, sample, sample. So there are two different, uh, yeah, two use cases uh, that we're covering, covering here. And depending also on what you have access to, uh, so some distributions, uh, they have a clear and easy expression for the CDF or the PDF and, and, and extra. Depending on that, you can choose from either one of these methods. So I invite you to, to go to the, um, to the SciPy documentation where we have listed all of that. And uh, there are some nice tutorials that they, they've written uh, during the course of the Google Summer of Code project. And so it was really a, a nice effort that they, they did. So they not only added the, uh, the methods, but also some nice um, documentation alongside. And so that's for continuous distributions. Uh, but we have the same for uh, discrete distributions, actually, which is also very interesting. Not so many methods at the moment, uh, but we could add more depending on yeah, use cases and interests uh, from people. The good thing is that Turf added a nice mechanism to add easily methods from uh, Unirun. And so we just uh, we have some templates, and it's very easy to add something new uh, when there, if we have the use case for it. And so how does it actually work in practice? It's very simple. Um, 
In this case, for instance, I'm using something called the numerical inverse uh, Hermit function. And uh, in this case, uh, we, are, we have this distribution which is called uh, FISC. Uh, we take some, so we define it. Uh, on the left, you can see how it works. If I sample it uh, normally in the sense of using the, the normal RVS method from the, the distribution, um, so it's using the inverse, either the inverse technique or some direct expression to get the, the random sampling. And so that's what we have. And we can, uh, we have exactly the same result uh, using the Unirom uh, sampler, uh, which is very convenient. As you can see, you just pass into this uh, function, the, the definition, uh, the, the distribution object, and then you can sample from it. So that's very easy to do. And I will show you later um, a real life example in the demo. So now, <laughs> moving on to uh, what is quasi Monte Carlo. So this is linked to what I was talking before uh, in the sense that when you're sampling, uh, your sampling is in, uh, using what is called Monte Carlo. And Monte Carlo and the difference between Monte Carlo and quasi Monte Carlo basically is that quasi Monte Carlo, it's a deterministic class of methods to sample numbers. And quasi mean, also means that the samples, they are linked to each other. So they are not anymore ID, so independent and identically distributed. Uh, some people say it's bad and argue that it's actually good <laughs> because uh, because it's not IID, um, you can have better properties in terms of coverage, uh, convergence, and extra. You you have a, a um, you you're able to, um, to to have a control over what you're doing when you're sampling. Of course, the drawback is that if you have some um, security application where you need your random number generator to not um, to not be linked to the previous draw. Uh, this is not going to work. This is not a secure way to sample uh, number, random numbers. So that's, the, that's actually one of the only cases I can think about uh, when I'm, when I'm, when, where you would not want to use uh, quasi Monte Carlo methods. And so as I was saying, this kind of methods um, provide, uh, enables you to sample better uh, in the space. And what do I mean here is that on the left, you have four dimensions uh, and you have a subplot in every two dimensions. And you can see on the diagonal, the histogram along um, each of the four dimensions. And here we're using a uniform distribution. And so uniform distribution, the probability to sample 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, etc. So from 0 to 1, it should be equal. So sh you should have a flat histogram, a flat probability density function. And here, as we can see on the left, it's really not the case. And here we just have uh, 256 points, if I remember correctly. And we can see that, yeah, the points are not uniformly distributed. If you repeat this oper the, the sampling um, a lot of time and, and you average, uh, in the end, you will have a somehow flat histogram and you will uh, somehow converge to a uniform distribution. What Quasi Monte Carlo allow you to do is to, without even having to resample and redo this operation, you will by default have something which is better distributed and following by default better the distribution that you want. So in this case, this method, so which is the Sobol method here, um, is very good at saying, okay, I'm fo strictly following a uniform distribution. So as you can see, the histogram is perfectly flat. And if you, 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 you redo the, comp the computation, it will be again perfectly flat. So you have a perfect uniform distribution in this sense. So of course, as I said, each point, they are linked to each other. So it really depends what your, what, what's your problem. And so what are other benefits? Uh, what, what, what is this uh, convergence is bringing to you? As I said, I spoke about convergence. And as we can see here, that's an example of um, a simple function. So it's a, a sum squared in five dimensions. So not much is happening. And still we can see that if you integrate this function and you know the mean of this function, so the Monte Carlo, you have a convergence rate of zero uh, O n uh, to the power of uh, minus uh, one over two. And if you go to a simple quasi Monte Carlo method, you will have a convergence ra rate of O n minus one, and you can even get O n uh, minus three over two, so 1.5. 
So it's really better because if you look at the error on the left, uh, so if you want to get an error of 10 minus 1, with a Monte Carlo method, you need what? You need 2 to the power of 11 point, whereas on the other hand, you need just 2 to the power of something like 7 or 8 uh, with the quasi Monte Carlo method. So if your fun so here the function is not costly, it's uh, maybe one nanosecond to, to, to evaluate, but if the function that you're interested about is an um, expensive simulation, for instance, it can really matter. You, it could mean that uh, before you would not um, be possible to do any analysis, uh, compute any mean or, or, or whatsoever. And here you really have then the, the power to actually do something. And so that's why quasi Monte Carlo methods are also very useful when you're building meta model, for instance. If you build a uh, Gaussian process regressor, for instance, it's very used uh, in the community because it allows you to, with very few samples, to build a nice Gaussian process regressor model. And it's preventing some overfitting because then you don't have that many points. Um, so a lot of benefits to, to be using this. And so what do we have now in SciPy? So in SciPy, this is under uh, stats.qmc. And we have added a few methods. So namely, Sobol, Halton, uh, Latin hypercube sampling. So maybe you've heard of this. Uh, it's like, um, making a Sudoku method. Um, so on every column and line, you just have one point, basically, if you, um, if you split the, um, uh, the parameter space. Um, we are adding something new in the next release with Poisson disk sampling. So this, um, this method is very used uh, in the imagery context. So it's, uh, I, that's the, the image which is shown here. So you have, a, you have a point, and you're saying the next point is going to be located um, uh, at least at this at this radius, at, at this distance from the from the previous point, uh, and so you're making this kind of bubble, and you're uh, you're building your your sample like that. And we have also some multinomial and uh, multivariate uh, normal distribution that we can build using quasi Monte Carlo um, uh, methods. And there's also something very interesting, which is the discrepancy. And the discrepancy it's a way to measure the quality of a sample. So by quality here, uh, we mean a statistical quality. You have namely two different criteria, uh, criteria that you can use to measure the quality of a, uh, of a sample, uh, n-dimension sample. You can either use di distance-based uh, methods or geometrical-based methods. So here, visually, you can say, oh, OK, I see that all the points, they are at least that far away from each other. So that's a distance-based method. And the other kind of met, uh, class of method, so the discrepancy, for instance, uh, is a statistical method saying that, oh, okay, it's more following this kind of distribution, so it's closer to a uniform distribution in n dimensions and also across all dimensions. So this gives a number, a metric, which allows you to say this sample should, should <laughs> be better in a statistical way than another sample. And so um, the, the API is very simple, uh, what we added um, in, um, uh, in SciPy. Um, so you can see here that we import again from, um, yeah, so that we, um, the, so you can, you can sample any distribution with this method that we added. Uh, here I, I took again the example of the, um, uh, of the FISC method. Uh, and again, with the, um, with the numerical inverse Hamid that we had before. And instead of calling the RVS, here I'm calling the QRVS, Q for quasi RVS, um, because we now have a way to say, okay, I want to sample using, um, using a quasi Monte Carlo method, uh, either a uniform distribution or a fist distribution or Gaussian distribution, anything. So you can, uh, you can easily play with quasi Monte Carlo either as a normal sampler, like a classical sampler, or uh, within this new framework that we have. Um, a few things that I should say about Quasi Monte Carlo is that there are a few gotchas, um, and there are a few things to keep in mind. So the Quasi Monte Carlo methods, um, they, they have to be used under certain, certain there, there, are, there is really a way to use Quasi Monte Carlo methods, and we tried really hard in SciPy to have meaningful warnings and ways to, 
to tell the user when they are doing something wrong. What I mean here is that, for instance, the Sobol method is only guaranteed to perform well in terms of conversions and space coverage uh, if you sample two to the power of n points. If you don't do that, you're breaking the, po the properties of your sample and you're actually not getting the conversions O uh, n to the powers minus three over two, but you will just get O n to the powers minus one over two, which is the converge convergence rate of Monte Carlo. So what you're actually effectively doing is using a QMC method, completely destroying it, and you're back to a Monte Carlo method. So you gain nothing, and you're even maybe thinking that you're doing something better. Yeah. And so I will just quickly show how it works. Uh, just a quick demo um, with, the, with some codes. Yay. Make it big. Make it big. Does it work? All right, do you see? Yep. Okay, so this is something uh, that we added in SciPy 1.7. So now everybody should be able to, to use it easily. And so that's how you import it. Um, here I'm, some, I'm doing something that I, which I hate. I'm using a seed. I will explain maybe a bit uh, why I don't like seed. So it's just to, to get the same graph here, uh, but please never use a seed. And I can, I'm ready to die on this hill if you want. <laughs> and so here I will just show quickly, that's how you create a light on hypercube uh, sample. Uh, so very simple, you specify the dimension, which is something common to all what we call engine, QMC engines. Um, and here I'm just using Seaborn, because I like it to plot uh, this 2D thing that I was showing to you. And here we have completely flat histograms, although we did not use many points. Um, but as you can see, we still have clusters of points. So it, this is not perfect. Uh, here we can calculate this metric, the discrepancy, very easy. You just pass the sample to the discrepancy function. And you can you have some conver uh, convenient function uh, to scale your parameters because all these engines they are working between zero and one, and so you can scale it to bounds. Of course, it's not changing the distribution. And as it's written here, the star of the show, I love this method, the Sobol method, because it's very performant. If you do the same, you have a lowest lower metric. So it was uh, there was a uh, it was a point point what point three, and here we we have. Point two, and as we can see here, the points are better distributed, and we, on some method, we have something called scrambling. So you can scramble the method because here you could see that oh, I can see some pattern, but maybe I don't want any patterns. Um, so here we can scramble. So very easy, and oh, as I told you, here if I don't put a power of two. We have nice messages telling you it's bad what you're doing. Please don't. Well, yeah. And so here I can quickly show how it works with the distribution. So here you import the fist distribution. You define it. I declare again my uh, and I sample it normally. So this is how you would normally sample this distribution, calling the RVS on the distribution. So that's how what you get. If you plot it, and now if you use the numerical inverse emit function, so the, the only difference is that I pass the distribution here uh, to this numerical inverse, and then here I want just wanted to show how you you add a custom engine if you want to do to use not the default engine, but uh, this is optional, and here. You have a nice plot. Um, if you look here at the histogram, it was not really catching it. So yeah, something better. And this just it was just some code um, to show that the convergence rate was better with the method. And this was to show that that's my O n minus uh, three uh, over two. So yeah, that was, uh, I will share all this notebook so that you can play with it and uh, you can see how it works. And I will be back here. 
So yeah, uh, a last call. Uh, thank you everyone because you you are actually making SciPy. Um, of course, we are as maintainer, but thanks to your issue reporting and all the PR that you're making, it's really helping us. And what I would like uh, to hear now is, are you actually using QMC? Are you using distributions? What do you need and how we can make it better for you to better help you? And if you would want to help us, please join the community, leave a star. We don't have stars on SciPy, not even 10,000. It's crazy. <laughs> so please leave a star. <laughs> and thank you everyone. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, lots of questions, but probably the one that everyone wants to know is, can you expand on why you prefer to avoid setting seeds? Uh, <laughs> so f the, the rationale behind it for me is that if you, so I'm talking about production code. For testing, I have no problem with using a seed because what you want to test in a software is you have an input to a function and you have an output which you want to get and if your process depends on some numbers, I'm fine with, with you using a seed. But if you have production code and you're using a seed, which by the way, are always one, two, three, zero, something like that, you're effectively not having anymore a random number generator. You're having a very bad number generator because it's fixed with this particular uh, design. And if you actually plot the distribution, if you uh, the seed that you're always using, one, two, three, or something like that, and you plot the distribution, the different distribution at the, uh, using the, this seed, you will realize that, oh, I don't have at all a uniform distribution with my, with my thing, or I plot the normal, I don't have a normal at all, so things like that. So that's mainly my, my argument, is that in production code, please don't use a seed. Great, thank you. Um, next question is from Gwen. Some random number generators use thermal noise of compute hardware to generate true random numbers. Is there a speed penalty that you pay for that? And what is the fastest way to generate true random numbers? <laughs> so how, the best way to, to create real number, uh, random number, that, that's the question. Um, I mean, your OS is already having some, some methods to, to generate true random number. Um, like in the system, it's taking into account the entropy of some, and measuring the temperature or things like that, uh, some unpredictable things, but it's, it's very hard and usually it really depends on the, yeah, because it's how I depend, it depends on the hardware and some measures. Uh, sometimes you exhaust uh, the, the numbers that you can get and you have to wait. And so you're limited by these kind of things. Um, here with QMC, the advantage is that you, you don't have this penalty because it's a sequence and you can just sample, sample, sample. And Sobol, for instance, with the latest version, uh, we removed one limitation which um, pre uh, prevented us to sample more than 2 to the power of 30. And now we can sample 2 to the power of 64 uh, numbers. And so we have plenty of numbers to sample from. Cool. Um, the next question is from Tom Carlyle. Is there any work done on Gibbs sampling or Metropolis Hastings sampling? Not really, and I'm not sure that we are going to go that direction um, because so you have a lot of so Pi Pi Q, uh, Pi, uh, Pi MC for instance, uh, they are having a lot of methods uh, along the along, uh, on this topic. Uh, Uniron, I, I know that in Uniron the library, the new library that we're integrated, the C library, has some metropolis testing and things like that. But I'm not sure if it's really on scope with SciPy. And there are already very good options in, into the, SciPy, the scientific um, Python ecosystem to, to choose from. And one goal of SciPy is not to take over <laughs> and integrate all the, the scientific um, tools. We, we want to, to help actually PyMC and other libraries like, um, like scikit-learn or uh, scikit-image. So we want to provide fundamentals brick for all these packages. Um, the next question from Zachary Del Rosario. Are there any built-in features for randomized QMC, for example, to estimate confidence intervals? Um, so we have now um, bootstrap, a bootstrap method, uh, which was added. And you can, uh, we did not hook it up with uh, QMC yet, um, but that's definitely something that we could do in the, in the future. 
Um, but yeah, you, you have built-in methods to, to do some bootstrapping and have confidence intervals and things like that if you won't want. Awesome. Thank you. I think that's uh, all the time we have for questions now. Um, there are a couple more questions in Slack uh, for you to take a look at. Mm -hmm. um, and thanks, everyone. Um, the next talk will start at 4.30. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>